Carly Fiorina ran her own big tech company, Hewlett Packard, and then went on to run for president. She is the founder and chairman of Carly Fiorina Enterprises and Unlocking Potential, and we welcome her now back to Bloomberg. So Carly, always a delight to have you here. As I say, you ran a big tech company. As you look at this, do these suggestions make sense to you? Well, first, David, it's a pleasure to be back with you. And before we get into the specifics, let me just say to you and the audience what I said to several of my Silicon Valley colleagues last week. I think technology, big tech, the Valley, needs to come to grips with the fact that this is a new era now. Technology for the longest time was secure in the knowledge that there was bipartisan support in Washington, D.C. for leaving them alone. They were in a special category. They grew the economy. No one was going to touch them. That era is over. And while there may be disagreement between Republicans and Democrats about the specifics, what there is bipartisan agreement around is the fact that big tech has too much power. There is bipartisan support for that, and Republicans said that in response to this report. There is also bipartisan, may I say, lack of trust in much of the leadership of big tech. And so whether these specific provisions go anywhere or not, I think technology firms need to deal with the reality that they are now in the crosshairs of Washington, D.C., and they need to think strategically about how to be part of the solution. Otherwise, they might uh, not like where this ends up. Carly, what do you make of the overall, as I take it, conclusion of this report, which is basically the very size of these very big tech companies, really the big four we're talking about now, have actually made it less likely there will be innovation, that there will be new upstart competitors to come along. From your experience, does that ring true? Because what the big tech companies say is, oh, no, we're investing all the money in the world in innovation. We're responsible for the innovation. Well, the truth is, David, I think both statements are true. I think if you look at where innovation traditionally has come from, it has come from the smaller startups. After all, that's what Google once was. That's what Amazon once was. That's what Apple once was. That's what all these companies, Facebook, once were. And it's also true that these huge technology companies now have a great interest in leveraging others' innovation, but they do so by buying them up. That's what they have done. And finally, I would say it is undoubtedly true that these companies have a market power and a power over consumers, not to mention consumer information, that's really almost unprecedented. And so I think they can, technology companies can no longer make a credible argument that somehow they are in a different category, that if you do anything to internet-based companies in terms of regulation or oversight, that somehow you are going to uh, curtail their growth. I just don't think that argument rings true anymore. And that's why I think strategically they need to think about how to be a part of this conversation instead of just saying, no, no, there's nothing to see here, there's nothing to do here. That's not going to fly. Carly, you mentioned earlier the leadership of some of these companies. Let's talk about leadership right now. How do you lead a company that arguably is winning by too much? You had a phenomenon with IBM, you could say that happened with. You could say it happened with Microsoft. What can a leader do in that situation? Well, first, I think, uh, I don't want to be too critical uh, here, but I do think that some of the leaders of some of these companies have, um, damaged their case a bit by being, we now know, less than forthcoming about what was really going on. And so we've seen, I think, too many instances where leaders have come before Capitol Hill, and let's face it, that's not a pleasant experience <laughs> for any CEO, and CEOs get very outraged about the hypocrisy, all of which is deserved. Nevertheless, when a CEO is found to be less than forthcoming, that's not helpful to their cause. So I think the most important thing for these tech CEOs to do is to decide strategically that the best course is not resistance at all costs, but instead to try and be part of the solution here. You know, I started my career out in telecommunications, and there was a long period of time where AT&T, as the big power, 
resisted at all costs being part of the solution. That resistance cost them in the end. And so I think these CEOs need to think through what are they willing to live with, how can they influence the legislative process here on both sides of the aisle to come up with something that's going to work, but just leave us alone isn't politically feasible anymore. And I think the economic arguments for just leave it alone, honestly, are no longer completely credible. Just briefly here, the conclusion, Carly, is it a, a plausible defense to say we've got to worry about China? <laughs> well, yes and no. I mean, yes, of course, we do need to worry about China. And that is why our approach to China must be consistent and persistent and strategic, and that requires collaboration between government and business, which hasn't always been in evidence <laughs> over the last 20 years. Uh, it also means that we need to be consistent across administrations when we deal with China and between parties, which we haven't always been. However, these tech companies are winning globally. It's why the European Union has taken some of them on. And so that argument is important, but I don't think it will be successful in saying, just leave us alone.